land far, far away, there's an enchanted warehouse owned by a wise man. He's a man with a magical collection of all kinds of really neat stuff, mostly cars. A very diverse collection of cars that any one of us could only dream of owning. But there's one in particular that I'm here to see. Well, one of the things I did want to say, because I've, I've had time to think about this before we came to talk to you, was, uh, you know, when I was young, er, <laughs> yeah, all of us. Yeah, um, this car is very significant, obviously, because it put food on my table. It was a hell of an opportunity to build something that really hadn't been done before. But now looking back, I can't believe the car is almost 20 years old. And then I think, oh my God, you had to pay for this thing. The guy who had to pay for all this is Glenn Grozich, owner of Billet Specialties. He's a longtime friend of mine, and I went to pay him a visit to see how he and one of my favorite cars, the Chicane, were doing. Well, first of all, we went to the right place yeah. to get it done. Uh, I had a lot of confidence in Troy and John Meany, who helped develop the fuel injection system with the turbos here on this, on this car. Um, and the car turned out to be everything I wanted it to be, and I think it was a great promotional piece for Bill Specialties yeah. at the time. I'd say so. In 2002, it was unveiled at SEMA, and right out of the gate, it won the Outstanding GM Vehicle Award, as well as a Mother Shine Award. And it won the popular Hot Rodding Good Guys 2003 Street Machine of the Year Award and the Chevy High Performance Magazine 2003 Chevy of the Year Award. So yeah, I'd say he's got some good press with this investment. Well, uh, do you mind if we see the engine? I want you to show it to us, like, the, uh, the engine in question. This is also the most badass engine compartment of the time. Yeah. Easy for me to say, but of course yeah, I'm... To think that was 18 years ago. Yeah, that's hard to believe. Yeah. Sure, it's pretty, but don't think for a second that's just for show. That sparkling twin-turbo jewel under the hood puts out nearly 1,200 horsepower, and it's reliable. Go figure. The car's got almost 7,000 miles on it since we've done it. We've driven it, haven't driven it in years. This car is really never been back for any major service or anything that really ever quit That's on awesome. this car. It's, uh, hey, we went to, I was telling you the story, we went to Columbus that year, we drove this car. Yeah. We had a 69 Camaro with us, and we had a 61 Ford. The chicane went there and back, the Camaro let the motor go, and the, and the, <laughs> and the radiator went out on the Ford. This was the only car that went there and nice. with no issues. That Twin turbos, good. all the crazy stuff in the world. Never missed a beat. I so it. it's just whatever Troy did, the people that he worked with, um, they made it work. There's this legend. I wasn't there. But I heard the one time you pulled up uh, in front of the hotel, and you know, everybody's fans of the car and did a big, nasty big burnout. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Who wouldn't? It was great seeing Glenn again. And the chicane was going to be at Troy's shop tomorrow for a thorough going over. But get this. Glenn gave me permission to take her out for some fresh air. Ooh, baby. Do we have a cool digital effect to get us to tomorrow? God, I have a lazy editor. All right, so it's the next day now, and that awesome guy driving the chicane, that's me. We had to take it kind of easy on her, though, because the car was full of old fuel, old fluids, and everything else, and I don't want to break an $80,000 engine just this moment in time. Yeah. So let's talk about what it's like to drive the chicane. In the land of the thousand horsepower vehicles, which this car started, in my opinion, a long time ago, what differentiates it? Well, first off, this thing's just easy as pie to drive. It's um, like in, in any almost like a Suburban. You just put it in gear and you go. I'm talking about something from like the mid-2000s, you know. It's a no-brainer. You don't need a PhD to drive it. You don't have to be a race car driver. It's obvious that this thing's really fast. You got over a thousand horsepower on tap. But the sound is probably my favorite part of this car. There's uh, dumps on the turbos which are, you know, cutout valves, basically. So the exhaust can run the full length of the car, so it's quiet. But I'm driving it now with them open, 
and there's this wonderful just chirping sound that comes from the turbos constantly just chirp, 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 chirp. and then you get that point where you start to roll into the accelerator and the chirping goes away and it turns into that jet noise that sucking sound that and you hear all of it and it's so fun about you know like I said it's just drivability how docile it is it just handles everything as you would expect a production car to which is really amazing because the control arms were made from scratch in this car in the front the entire rear suspension and frame and everything were made from scratch to accommodate those massive wheels and like I pointed out earlier this car is the king of firsts also not just the king of street machines there's so much innovation in this thing that it's uh, pretty mind-boggling and hard to believe that it's true that this was the first car to sport all of those amenities as a hot rod or a street machine rather than just actually be bragging about it you know this actually happened creating one-of-a-kind masterpieces isn't always about making highly functional badass street machines sometimes it's about making highly functional badass speed record setting machines Say hello to my little friend! The Mariani Streamliner. Yes, it's as fast as it looks, but it has something you don't see just every day on cars. Its own hydraulic jacking system. So when we built the liner, obviously it's uh, it's built for speed, but it's got to, you got to be able to work on it and function. And obviously you can see it's you know five eighths of an inch off the ground. So we would, we did two things. For us to be able to load it onto the trailer, we just made the nose so you can raise this. The nose four inches and get it out of the trailer and then obviously to work on it you got to be able to get under it so we built this onboard hydraulic system so now we're able to get under it and we just put stands under it for safety but uh, obviously you got to think of that stuff when you're building them and what's nice about this car it has an onboard hydraulic system so no matter where you're at on the course, if you pull off the course you need to raise it, you can do it on its own. You don't have to have a support vehicle to raise it. So some guys have lift systems, but you gotta have the retrieval truck and trailer following you always to work on it. So this one's nice, it can lift itself up and we can service it. So then obviously it's really simple uh, going back down. Um, and there you are. So pretty much everything, everything you do, you gotta, you gotta build the function side of the racing into it, and also the serviceability. So, and as we, this is the third race car we built, so you keep getting smarter, and it kind of evolves, and you make it more, more user friendly. So the Blowfish was the first car we ever built, and a little bit not, not as user friendly, but as it kept evolving over the years with different engines, we made it more friendly to work on. So that's a big part of it, because when you race out there, if you do qualify. You go in the impound and you have four hours to work on it, and that's it. So you got to make it serviceable so you can turn around and to, to reset the record. Powered by a naturally aspirated first generation 372 cubic inch small block, it makes around 1100 horsepower at 10,000 RPM. Now this is set in motion with a Liberty 7 speed air shifted trans and needless to say, this car doesn't like to be left sitting around in the shop. And as it turns out, the Marianis want to get moving on dialing in this monster for the future world record. And with next to no notice, I was told that they decided that the conditions were good enough to go to Bonneville. Now they're going to take the car out for a spin at the Salt Flats to get a feel for it and see if there's any modifications that needed to be done before making future record runs. Now this is important because as I said in a previous episode, there aren't really test and tune nights. You have to commit to going out there, setting up shop for a week, just to get some data back on the car. It's crucial, but it's necessary. Man, I have driven this drive, this will be twice in two months, and it's a 5,000 mile round trip at minimum. So I grabbed old Shitter and we stuffed ourselves into his car, because I'll be damned if I was gonna put those miles on my car again this year. And we headed to the Bonneville Salt Flats as quickly as his little four-cylinder could get me there. And it was a 36-hour drive, by the way. No showers, no stopping to clean ourselves up, just straight on through. 
Well, he had never been west of the East Coast, so he took a lot of pictures on the way. Just don't know why he took so many. Or those ones of me sleeping. When we finally got to the salt, Troy and his crew already had their hands full. As you saw in the previous episode, they were busy getting Matt Jules Roadster primed to break a record. seen the Mariani streamliner in the shop, so it's nice to see it at the track that it was built for. With a machine as capable as this, data is everything because this car is going into a territory that very few have ever been, so information is scarce. The Mariani streamliner has only been on the salt once before, and on its previous trip it went over 350 miles per hour without even breaking a sweat. Then a rainstorm turned the salt flats back into a lake before another run could be made and they've been waiting on Mother Nature to cooperate ever since. Now they need to run the car to collect data on it so they can dial it in and get it to break its class record. This means that even though they're not going to be breaking the record, they're still going to be running at over 300 miles an hour to get the information they need. You ready? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. That's, what see. That's the one we need, Dennis. With speeds like that, that the first right thing to get right is the parachute. Those speeds make a chute absolutely essential to getting the car stopped safely, and the crew wants it working perfectly. With no natural barriers, a car could coast for miles before getting stopped, potentially putting the driver dangerously far from a rescue team. And with that safety in mind, Dale paid special attention to the adjustment of the driver's seat belt. Maybe a little too much attention. He needs that center one adjusted again, Dale. Yeah. He keeps telling me. Yeah, please. Hey, that cross strap's not quite there. With all the safety checks comfortably out of the way, it was time to get the streamliner onto the trailer and head to the starting line. first run, something wasn't right with the transmission. It seemed to be skipping fifth gear and would jump to sixth, causing the car to fall on its face. The track surface was pretty rough and still had some imperfections. Like a reflection of the water that once covered the track surface, those little wave shapes translated into a very rough surface at high speed. Think about hitting anything on the highway at over 250 miles per hour. Wouldn't shift. No? I, it didn't feel like it. How fast did I go? Uh, two, two, what was this? 65? Yeah. It didn't want to shift. It didn't feel like it was shifting. It was like, oh, it really? was vibrating like, like when it didn't want to shift it was yeah. An initial run of 265 miles an hour didn't come close to this car's potential, but considering it was only the second time down the track, there was a lot learned about the adjustments that needed to be made for the car to go faster. Back at the pits, the first thing to figure out was what was going on with fifth gear. The transmission air shifting circuit is vented into the atmosphere, which actually allowed small amounts of salt to get into the valves causing a misfire on one of the solenoids. Well, so we found some uh, salt in that manifold as well as some of the air valves and cleaned all that out this morning and finally got it to shift. So more than likely that's what happened on the first pass is it um, skipped a gear or something. Uh, he shifted through it, but he knew that he was out of gear and uh, just didn't make the speed, so. I think we're gonna try, I think we're gonna try get it up there here pretty quick before it gets too hot this afternoon. On 
the second run, the rough surface actually caused the car to shift sideways a little bit, and it stalled. Now there are sensors on the car that could have shut it down for safety reasons, or maybe it was so rough that it was just hard for Dennis to even keep his feet on the pedals. What do you got going there? Just shut off? It can die, but when it went sideways, did it hit the power switch or something? I don't know. And the car was off to a good start, but the rough track kept Dennis from really being able to push the car. How'd they do? 314, 329 exit speed. Oh, cool. So, you're getting there. Yeah. Can you? You bet. Absolutely. Just a second. After reviewing the data, they learned that the track was so rough it was causing the rear wheels to bounce off of the ground intermittently throughout the run. Computer's answer to this was to activate traction control to try to keep the engine's power down so it could reduce the wheel slip. Now, this is accomplished by retarding the engine's timing. The timing was actually down 17 degrees, which is a ton of power, and the car still made a very strong run. That's all right. We got oh, we got to find right. out what's going on. <laughs> well, knowing that the ride was very rough, and for this season the track's only going to get worse, and without being able to predict the future, a decision was made to load the car back into the trailer and take it to the shop, where they could update the rear suspension of the car so that it would better adapt to the ever-changing conditions of the track surface at Bonneville. Now this is going to be a major undertaking for the Rad Rides team, and I look forward to seeing what kind of problem solving they're going to throw at this thing to make a rear suspension for it. What we're going to do uh, before next August is we're going to make this rear end just have a little bit of travel. And it's not going to need much, like, you know, literally three quarters of an inch, an inch would be enough. Just enough to have some tractive effort when you hit those little bumps. Yeah, something you know, kind of absorb Yeah, to that. absorb it so it keeps the rear end planted, right? Yeah. So, um, so that's the idea. So now we just got to kind of figure out, you know, we got to do some type of little four link back here or whatever and make this rear end active. The good news is, like the way the engine and tranny set up, the way we built it the first time, you can obviously you can see we have a, I did a water tank originally, just in case we ever go to a turbo. So we have a water tank and oil tank. So basically I can get rid of the, the water tank uh, and move, just move it, you know, move the radiator up to here, mm. engine up to here. So, so let's say, I don't know, honestly, if we could probably get a foot, and the only reason we're trying to get this foot is we gotta have somewhere for a drive shaft. Oh, okay. You know, that's like right now, okay. right now this thing's direct coupled. Oh. It's just got a coupler on it. So we need a little bit of room for the drive shaft is why we have to move everything forward. I can't wait to see what they come up with as far as changes to the streamliner and how it does when it returns to the salt. You'll get to see that because I'm going to bring it to you. There is so much potential for this thing for some serious speed. We've only seen the beginning. And speaking of fast cars, we'll be showing you the finished little red wagon and more on the next episode of Rad Rides.